Okay, guys and girls, getting out the distiller, doing the, the, the. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. <laughs> you know, I've just been looking forward to it for a long time. Interestingly enough, this time round, um, the findings didn't seem to have done their job. The wash didn't actually get clear, and I don't quite know why that is. Uh, have to do some more research to work out why that is, but either way, um, I'm going to get distilling. Got the ceramic boil enhancers inside the boiler. That's these uh, little ceramic cylinders and I'm going to get it filled up through using the siphon and we're just going to get distilling. Don't know whether you can see that but the um, liquid is being siphoned off quite nicely. The liquid level is going down in the barrel quite well. Um, it's still coming out murky. The whole thing smells like a combination between a baker's and uh, vinegar and a bar. So it's quite disgusting in some respects, unless of course you like that sort of thing. Now, got out a couple of jars there as you can see. Four jars should be enough because each jar is one pint, maybe 500, uh, 500 milliliters. And of course I've got a couple of extra jars over there, just two more which already have some ethanol inside it. So essentially if I, if I do make more, uh, that would take a miracle of course, you know. Then I've got sort of like over, overflow capacity to put them in. And I'm going to get another jar somewhere which I'm going to use to collect the heads, which is of course the high volatiles, which will be put somewhere safe so I can use that as methylated spirits and burn it for fuel for cooking. So, we're down to about there, so far. Uh, oh, the liquid seems to have stopped. I'm going to have to rejig that. But you can see there's a whole mess of muck just down there. It looks kind of stringy, and it's very similar to the mess of muck we got up there. Now, that's what the findings do. It takes all the solid matter and it clumps it all together so that when you're racking it, when you're you know using your siphon, it doesn't go into your finished product. So it's quite interesting to see it in action. Um, but I get the feeling this fermentation wasn't complete. Okay, so I'd have to use more sugar, more, basically more of everything, more of the um, nutrient to try and get the desired effect. But I'm down pretty much as far as I can get. There's only a bit of crap left over. So I'm going to get on with the, with the distilling. Okay, so I don't have the prerequisite type of screw top tap. Uh, I've had to use one of these things. I've used it before and it's very difficult to get it right uh, so that we can get it fitting on without water pouring everywhere. Uh, either way, it seems to be okay. This is the water inlet to the distiller itself. The water outlet is there. Uh, we've got some water flow there, which is already lowering the temperature on the lower thermometer. The top one is at 19, sorry, 18.9 at the very top, and the bottom one's at 14.5, showing it's already been lowered in terms of temperature. And this is just the start of the run. It's got all the mash in there. Um, alcohol tube is ready to take any alcohol that comes off. Now it's got to sit back and wait and monitor the water flow and think carefully about the temperature which is being achieved on the bottom thermometer, keeping it between 50 and 60 degrees, ideally about 55, which is going to be fiddly as a really fiddly thing. Whilst the still is steadily reaching temperature, I've had myself a lunch of broccoli, rice cakes, sardines, and a spot of French mustard. Well, whole grain mustard. It was very nice indeed. Mmm. Running the cooling fluid this way is quite wasteful, as you can see, just all that water just being poured right away. Okay, so I'm going to set myself up a system eventually, it's going to have like a, a, a car radiator with a fan blowing on it and a pump so I can recycle the water. And then that'll provide the cooling and everything that I need in that particular respect, okay. And I'll be able to get that um, powered for the period of four hours of a full distillation run of, uh, of the battery bank. So that will save on the water when the time comes. The plan is still to get myself completely utterly off grid, you know, that's, that's the goal. And with your help, and with the, you know, the links down there, we can do it. 
Uh, some of you, I guess, might be wondering why I'm spending so much time focusing on distillation and uh, not as much time focusing on soda. Well, this distiller um, was... I guess I treat it like it was a gift because someone contributed an awful lot to the work I'm doing here on this video blog and if I don't use the, the equipment that he helped me get together then I guess I would not be respecting the gift giver and I certainly wouldn't be respecting the gift. Yeah, sure, I'm going to tackle all kinds of other issues on this channel, but let's do one thing at a time and also show respect to those who've given uh, a good donation to help me out with this project. Thank you. Now this is where it gets really hectic, because I've got to maintain the bottom temperature, which as you can see is climbing very steeply at uh, between 50 and 60, but ideally about 55. And the only way I can do that is to adjust the flow of water on the tap. So I've got to keep all my sensors, you know, focused on this big time. This is going to be interesting. Okay, we got the temperature okay, but it's still increasing bit by bit, so I've got to carry on watching the water flow. And we got product being developed. The fuel of the future kind of thing. And that's the first jar of E90 or E94 made up. As you can see, it's not quite there for drinking quality. It's got a couple of cat hairs in it. I should have washed out the jars before I started the distillation run. But the uh, there we go. So that's going to burn. That's going to keep me warm in the winter when, when the uh, power goes out. Now I'm looking forward to that. Okay. So on today's distillation run, I'm quite lucky because the temperature's held up without me having to adjust the water flow too much. It's creeping up a bit now, so I'm going to have to tone that um, tone that down in just a few seconds. But eh, it's working. And remember, to put it in perspective, this fuel is made from sugar, yeast nutrient, and wine yeast. Okay, you sterilize it to prepare the area, so there will be no bacteria inhibiting or slowing down or stopping the fermentation. But it's simple to do the fermentation and then the rest of it is just the skills you need for the actual distillation itself it's all working out quite nicely that's that stuff's gonna burn that's that's my cooking fuel when all the lights go out and this here is jar number two and this one's clear as a very clear thing okay that's no dust, no debris in it. That's come out beautiful. Um, and if you smell it, it'll burn the, the hairs of your nose off. It's, um, it's good. More fuel. Temperature on the still is getting a little, little bit more erratic, requiring a little bit more attention to try and keep the bottom temperature just right. But that's part of the course as you get further on in the run. But there we go. And that's draw number three being created right now. Mm-hmm. Hear the sound of energy. This one here is jar number three, so I'm well on target considering there's more flu fluid is being produced in there for me to be well on to making the four jars that was my goal or my target for this one particular run. Uh, I've got another jar put aside just in case, you know, it's just a wishful thinking jar if you get my drift. But there we go, you know. Brilliant. So now I just need like um, the off-grid way of heating a pot. I mean the working part of the still is the vertical distillation column. And then you just need a way of um, keep, keeping water going through at the right temperatures. And for that you can use a system of pumps and fans uh, to recycle the water and make sure that's powered by batteries which are charged off-grid using solar. And then you just need any container which can connect to the bottom of that still, uh, that um, condenser column, and then basically you can do any you know any volume with this thing. And as far as heat source is concerned, 
Oh, I probably want to scavenge some wood, use wood gas technology. Uh, yeah, it's doable. It's doable. But I'm just celebrating deep down inside the fact that my fermentation run went okay. Um, the fact that I am actually making some usable f um, fuel, which means that this winter I don't have any, any worries if the, if the power goes, you know what I mean? So prepared for that kind of eventuality. I mean, we had a system of, uh, situation a couple of years back. And it was actually on December the 21st. Longest night. And then the electricity went and the place went arctic very quickly. Uh, I don't have to worry about that. If you have like one day when that happens. I don't have to worry about it getting too too cold, and I don't have to worry about not being able to cook or to boil water for tea. I just don't have to do that. That's why I like alcohol, and that's the best use for it. Okay, now this I just don't understand. We're moving closely into the realms of, like, mathematical improbability. Because this is the, I mean... I thought I'd get four of these half pint, um, pint, pint jars filled, so I filled up those four jars, and I, this was my just in case I was to get a bit extra jar, and hey presto, it's damn nearly full itself. And there's still alcohol being produced at a good rate. Now, for whatever reason, uh, I've managed to get the temperature nice and stable today, okay? Sure, it's required some adjustment, but 55 degrees is like the best temperature that you can have, I think, if, if my knowledge is correct. So maybe that's one of the reasons why extraction has been quite so efficient today. And there's still stuff coming out of there, and I've got yet another just-in-case jar put aside here, and I think I'm going to set that one up and see if I can get just a few more drips in there, because if I do, then that's good, and if I don't, then it doesn't matter. But to have five half pint, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, pint jars, half litre pint jars fall to the shoulder is good. I mean, yeah, sure, I haven't been going right up to the very top of them. So maybe there's an argument to say that, you know, that extra distance that I like, added up a couple of times will make up one of these jars. But, damn it, when I did it properly with the commercially available uh, spirit making yeast, drink making yeast, okay, I didn't do quite as well as I'm doing on this run. So either way, the spirits of spirit making, or the gods of spirit making, are smiling on me, and I'm very happy about that, because that's, that's cook fuel. Okay, guys and girls, this is the level of mathematical impossibility, okay? Because I've made six jars, and I'm still, whoops, making some more over there. So I'm just testing the percentage of the alcohol and it's just shy, and this is with the spirit hydrometer, just south of 90%. Okay? So it's still good spirit, and we are in the levels of mathematical impossibility, taking into account the quantity of alcohol that's being created. Um, this is unbelievable. This is the most successful, most efficient uh, distillation run I've ever done in my entire life, well, since I've had this thing. And it's unbelievable. It really is incredible. It's past believability. So I guess the secret, if you're going to use a wine yeast, is to do a really, really long fermentation. Use plenty of nutri nutrient uh, and keep the cost down. Okay, guys and girls, this is intense. All right, <laughs> this is impossible. I, don't, I mean, just like look at this. Oh, God Almighty, just like. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pint jars, okay, half liter jars. I've tested them all with the with the spirits hydrometer. And they've all come out between eighty-five and ninety percent alcohol by vo alcohol by volume. Okay? Which means they're all good enough for combustible fuel quality, which is what I was looking for, but I had no idea that this wash would be able to create this much. Now, I'd be much more skilled with control of the temperature than I've ever been before on previous runs. That is true. But to get this much, just look at it. 
just just look at it I mean this is amazing this is beyond my wildest expectations for what this run could be able to produce and you know what's really really spooky all right taking into account it was six kilograms worth of standard sugar which I had purchased from the 99p shop and they did a deal at 82 pence per kilogram all right it was a wine nutrient all right which I got from Amazon and it was enough regular wine yeast to be able to make up one you know five liter sorry five gallon bucket of wine mixture and the strange thing is it's still <laughs> it's still producing even more product you know we're we're over the rainbow here this is like ah oh, isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your entire life ever I mean seriously um, I'm not joking your chain here man I mean this is ah oh, that's just <sighs> Come on with the snow, you know, um, this is the most efficient run ever, I'm sure. Okay, that level of success which I managed to get in this one particular distillation run is unprecedented. I've got seven and a half of these half litre jars, one pint jars, with plenty of alcohol in them. I only expected to get four out of this run. So I've now got to try and summarise what I've actually learned from this particular distillation process, fermentation and distillation process. Firstly, if you're fermenting uh, using something like a wine yeast, leave it for a long time. Okay, it appears that the longer you leave it, basically the better. Secondly, make sure you've used some good nutrients and quite a lot of them. Okay, obviously make sure all the other fermentation um, safeguards are in place, such as um, sterilization of all of the equipment and so on and so forth. Then when it finally comes to distillation, you can still use regular wine finings. There was a very strange sort of hydrogen sulfate, kind of like sodium made up by sulfate type smell to the bioethanol that came out. And I don't know what that's due to, but obviously I'm not going to carbon filter it, which is what a person who was making drinking alcohol would probably do. So, you know, that smell will probably be there anyway. So there's something different about the process, which means that you get a different result, basically. But when doing the distillation itself, seriously control the water output temperature as if your life depends upon it. Try and keep it as close to 55 as you can, 55 degrees Celsius, okay? Uh, or if you can't do that, then between 50 and 60. Be very careful about that and watch it like a hawk continually. Uh, apart from that, try and, you know, take your time over it. Don't rush, don't be hurried and you may get some amazing results. I mean, I'm seriously impressed with what I've done there. All right, if I was a drinker and I was using this to make drinking alcohol, I would probably say that taking into account that I used six kilograms of sugar, I used half a pack of wine making yeast, as it came in a tub designed for two fermentations of uh, five gallon barrels, okay. Uh, I used obviously the sterilizer and I used some wine nutrient and that's basically all the stuff I needed for the fermentation itself. Uh, I used some citric acid which I would also bought to help clean off the copper saddles which go at the top of the fractional distillation column. Didn't pack the column too heavily and just made sure I controlled the temperature and I've got this absolutely fantastic result. This is Amazing. Seriously amazing. I'm just going to show it to you one more time just to remind you how amazing it is. Here we go. One, two, six, seven and a half. All right, and I've still got two more jars left over, plus three more samples of the methanol, which was the heads of the previous distillation runs, which I can also use for... Uh, methylated spirit stoves and so on and so forth. I can use that for transier methylated spirit stoves anyway. So it's astounding. There you go. That's the most successful run I've had and at the lowest cost. I probably spent on average or approximately 10 pounds on the raw materials. Obviously not the equipment but on the raw materials to make this quantity of bioethanol. And that stuff will burn and therefore 
you know, when it's cold, I can have one whole day of staying warm and still being able to cook if everything goes a bit belly up as far as the weather is concerned. So thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to rate, comment, subscribe, favorite, and share. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon on the Get Me Off Good video blog. Don't forget also, there are links below if you want to support it, okay? And if you want me to focus in on one particular aspect of off-grid living or self-sufficiency or alternative and home energies, then, you know, make, make a donation and tell me that you want me to focus in on that thing and I'll see what I can do. Can't promise it, but I can try. See you in a while.